Hey everybody, my guest today is Dr. Ali Jaffe and we are talking about mental health and technology. So Ali is a doctor, a patient and a founder and that's why this interview is so good. So Ali is really open with us on this episode and I'm incredibly grateful to her for being so open. She talks about her own mental health journey being diagnosed with depression, generalized anxiety disorder, having panic attacks and having a long time diagnosed with clinical depression, but she talks about what helped her out of that clinical depression. And interestingly, we talk about antidepressants on here and we talk about drug therapies. And whilst quite often on this podcast, I think we might um, denigrate, for want of a better word, uh, drug therapies for, uh, you know, the what we believe is right in, in technology and what technology can do, there is clearly a place um, for drug therapies in the right way. And, and we talk about that here. So despite Ali being somewhat of an, of an evangelist of technology, we actually talk about the value of antidepressants, particularly personally for her in her journey to help her get over an acute episode. Um, so yeah, we talk about that. We talk about some of the uh, technologies that Ali is involved with, um, particularly around facilitating human to human interaction interaction and that being a place where mental health uh, technology solutions can play a huge part because actually um, she talks about education, she talks about this interaction piece, but she also talks about management and prediction being these three areas where technology can actually make a huge difference in mental health. The first two, education and social interaction, really being places where the business models um, are, are quite favourable in that there are lots and lots and lots of companies that can do lots and lots of things in those two areas. And actually that's more involved in like a prevention space or as she refers to it, daily coping strategies. And actually as we start to really think about health tech and where health tech is going to make impact, prevention and these daily coping strategies are areas where we can keep people away from mental health services by keeping them mentally fit and by keeping them mentally healthy. So really important areas to cover. Um, we talk about Ali's journey a bit as a founder as well, as a founder of NutriTank. Uh, NutriTank being a think tank for uh, nutrition um, and obviously uh, nutrition through the microbiome linked very much to mental health, not least uh, the microbiome affecting how drugs are metabolized, but also uh, quite literally affecting our mood and, and lots of research going on there. We talked about that with Thomas last time uh, in a few episodes ago on this podcast. So loads in this one about mental health and technology. So I hope you enjoy it. So Ali, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, thanks. I'm loving that I've got a day off on a Friday today. So Glorious. all is good with me. How are you, James? How's I'm your right. tennis? I'm all right. My tennis is good. My tennis is good. Got a win. Got two wins last week. Will we see you at, will we see you at Wimbledon this year? <sighs> There's this interesting time of life that passes you where you think, oh, I might actually no longer make it as a professional sports player. <laughs> Um, I might not actually You're get geriatric. scouted You're right. to play in that football team. You're like right. I might not actually play mm. at a Grand Slam or even an ATP tournament or even a Challenger Tour tournament. That time has definitely passed me. Um, so I'm now I'm now accepting that I might not reach tour level, uh, but nonetheless, mm. that does not curb my enthusiasm nor my competitive nature at playing division one or division two woking league tennis where i do go full pelt wow. and i do i mean oh my. right i literally literally i i understand your reaction it is it is a really high level of tennis um that's mega mm -hmm. yeah so uh it's it's still enjoyable it's still enjoyable for me so i might not play at roland garros but or wimbledon or indeed any of the grand slams but as i say i enjoy myself when i go to godalming tennis club and uh knock out a couple <laughs> of sets so uh yeah i'm appreciative of where i'm never say life. never never say never you may not be a spring <laughs> chicken anymore but who knows maybe, exactly. maybe a new exactly. league will open up <laughs> well, exactly. I could still get onto that Masters tour. And then there's always um, golf, yeah. Oh, there's always, <laughs> there's no, always you're golf. No, you're right. I live in Surrey, right? So there is there is always golf. There is always golf. And um, that's for any age. That that doesn't for, exclude because my 65-year-old you know father, wow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good on him. Exactly, exactly. I've had I've had three golf lessons, so I am accepting that I'm in the golf phase of my life. 
Um, mm. But I need these. I need. I need these sports breaks. Like what we do as founders and as company builders and as content creators. You're on the treadmill a lot. You know. You need these kind of. Yeah. Uh, that's why I like tennis, actually. And I know we're going to talk about food, mood, and mental health and tech. But I I love tennis here because there is absolutely no physical way it's not possible to think about anything else when you're in the middle of a rally than hitting that tennis ball uh, like uh, and making sure it gets to the other side and it doesn't it doesn't finish on your side like you 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 just there is nothing else that can possibly go into your mind and especially when you want to win and you've got a competitive nature that you're you're you are strategically thinking about the game the point the match the the next that you are you're just in it like my ability to be present playing tennis for two three hours at a time is incredible like I genuinely do just forget anything else because I am so focused on playing and playing well and winning and all that stuff and it's it's one it's it's such wonderful uh release from all of the burdens that you have trying to build a company like it it finding that and finding flow state I guess is just so it's so important to me but as I say, it's a pleasure having you on because I'm I, I can talk about this stuff with you and I know that you've got Same and I can tell you all the things here. that I get into flow state with. Exactly. But I, I completely agree. And there's something like beautiful about actually being able to use your hands and not being able to have access to your phone and just being solely focused and present in that moment. And I think for me, I'm not someone who's ever really been successful with meditation. I think it can be quite exclusive and it's all about finding the way to get the benefits from meditation, but through other outlets. So it's more inclusive, especially when I was speaking to a patient who has zero interest in trying meditation. I think it's about meeting someone where they're at and saying, well, why don't you just try to be mindful with that activity and outlet that you already do, but think about how you can just be completely zoned into it. And that's why I love mindfully cooking and literally just solely focusing on the sound of the chopping of the vegetables, the colours and you know making it all very multi-sensory or for me my my tennis is actually the arts and film and theatre and I remember when I was at medical school I I literally when I was having a bit of a emotional dysregulation kind of panic I would say do you know what I'm going to the cinema by myself it's my absolute sanctuary it's a dark room other people around you, that collective experience, a sole focus of just a, a, you know, lit up projection and being able to just let your unconscious ravel and relating to stories on the screen. So that's where I feel like I'm completely mindful and in the moment. Um, I'm not very sporty. I'll put it out there. I'm not a sporty <laughs> girl. Do like a bit of yoga and walking and hiking, but I'm not the sportiest. <laughs> I love that. I love that. When you're watching those films, are you... Are you in the story or are you academically looking at the filmmaking itself? Are you appreciative of lighting and Such angles good question. and all that stuff? It's the, sum of its, it's the sum of its parts, isn't it? Because I'd say, so recently I saw Babylon, which mm. is a really cinematic experience. It's something that I would say you can't really watch on um, on like an aeroplane screen or a screen at home because it's just so visual and surround sound. It's quite frenetic in how it's yeah. been edited at times. And I was focused on the story and the character development and really empathising with them on screen. But then because it was visually so beautiful mm. and the way it had been cut and edited, I was also like having a running commentary about that in my head. And it comes in different phases and um, sometimes you only think about it on reflection after or you're thinking about it in that moment. Like, wow, these colours and the way, you know, that shot has been done. I'm loving it. So a bit of both. I love that. I love that. We're we're getting into so much more filmmaking stuff at Somex and like the more time I spend really? with the videographers oh, and wow. the more time that we are storyboarding and doing all this stuff to create oh. video, it's just the more I love mm-hmm. that stuff. And actually, yeah, composition. I've always been into photography and videography a little bit, especially my nephew's one of our videographers and he's incredible. Like he's always flying around the world filming yeah. supercars and yachts. Keep and it in the family. Stuff. I love well, that. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It just makes it a bit more enjoyable mm-hmm. when it's someone you know that well. And you have, we have these shoot days where we're with clients and we're talking about the story they're trying to tell and we've we've drawn out the storyboard and we're collecting all the shots and we're setting up these scenes and you know it's 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 so nice and it's so nice that i guess academically looking at the storytelling behind it and and 
how you actually tell that story properly and and there and the story arc and there are different story arcs and there are different ways to tell certain stories it's it's, it's absolutely fascinating this stuff but it's an yeah. art and a science storytelling and i would literally say that it's one of my key things to happiness is how i tell my story how i'm intentional and deliberate with the way i live my life and how i mm. create my story and you know i love the saying that um the paintbrush are your thoughts and the painting is your reality and i think really intentionally about the thoughts in my you know in my um in my mind and how i can kind of disrupt negative thought patterns and then also what i'm consuming for my mind because for me um which i'll talk about when my mental health was at its lowest i in my recovery was very intentional about the things that I consumed from nourishment, from nutrition, from moving my body, from social connection, but actually from the stories that I was letting get into my mind. And I then really made an active effort to um, always have inspiring stories and creativity as a key kind of tenant for my mental health, which is why I love TED Talks, I love LinkedIn, I read so much nonfiction because I think that is one of the best ways to really connect with people and realise that we're all human, we're all capable of so much and we've all had setbacks, experienced adversity. But let us let me hear from brilliant founders or brilliant actors who uh, have gone through things and what their short-term and long-term strategies are to um, improve. And I think it's a wonderful collective thing that we have. I love that. So that's a bit of a window into your story, but let's start at the beginning. So why don't you tell us what makes you you? Tell us your story. So I am a junior doctor and I'm also someone who loves creativity and fashion and the arts. You know, I'm always dressed in colour and it's how I express myself. And I've really got to know myself over the last four years, really since I had a huge breakdown within my mental health. Uh, that was when I'd say I started flourishing and thriving once I'd actually come out the other side of that. And I think... I almost was living life in a way that I couldn't be fully fulfilled up until that point. So when people say, what's your biggest achievement? And they follow me on socials and they see kind of academically and professionally what I've done, I actually say my biggest achievement is getting to know myself and how I can keep my mental health stable. Because there was a time where I didn't want to live, let alone qualify from medical school and be a doctor. And, um, so my story kind of starts, I guess, when I went to medical school, I had taken a gap year and was already really passionate about holistic healthcare, food systems and the cultural aspects of food. I'd done some traveling and also uh, been exposed to the science, um, the nutritional science in Australia and America, which are far ahead of the game for us Um uh, compared to us in the UK in terms of preventative medicine and proactive healthcare. So I became really intrigued by that. And at medical school very early on, that's when I realised I wanted to be part of a systems change, especially within the UK healthcare system and making it more around holistic healthcare and preventative medicine. And that's when I founded Nutritank and um, I co-founded it with a fellow medical student. And we were very frustrated by the fact that First line management for every chronic condition, uh, according to the NICE guidelines, is off a patient's diet and lifestyle. Yet what we were being taught and what we were witnessing in practice and the application on the wards is that people just jump straight to the pharmacological intervention healthcare professionals do. And that's no fault of their own. That comes from the system not equipping them with the tools and understanding to be able to have meaningful conversations with patients about the theory of nutrition and lifestyle and its application. Because people assume it's just very pseudoscience-y and woolly and airy-fairy, but actually we've got surplus of evidence now around the importance of nutrition to not only prevent chronic disease, but also manage the system the symptoms of chronic disease and put it in remission once it's onset. So I became very passionate about that and got on the founders train. I was obsessed with entrepreneurship and um, I was finding it almost slightly more interesting than the day-to-day -day science I was learning at medical school because it had that creativity aspect to it and that limitless kind of um, factor of you know, it's all up to you. What you put in is what you get out, essentially. 
And we did really well very early on. We got a lot of exposure and a lot of press and impact very early on and managed to build a nationwide network of medical students across the country who built their own Nutritank branch of their medical school where they could educate others in their medical school about nutrition and lifestyle and be educated by expert speakers that came in. And we were just, my co-founder and I, we were constantly building and hustling and it was just, it became our brainchild. We were obsessively um, building something, as I'm sure you know the feeling. (laughs) And I've always been passionate about the mind. And since I was a teenager, I've just been completely enthused by understanding different theories of the mind, philosophy of the mind, science of the mind. And it comes from a lot of personal experience because I've got a lot of mental illness that runs in my family. And so very early on, I had a fascination which stemmed from that. Um, My grandfather on my mum's side, very sadly, um, was a doctor in South Africa and took his own life, um, dying by suicide two weeks after I was born. And um, so that had a huge ripple effect on my entire family and also um, of my understanding around mental illness and finding out about it all at a really young age and having that exposure. So I was always passionate about helping those most vulnerable and um, in need in society when it came to mental health. And then halfway through medical school, I started experiencing generalised anxiety disorder and panic attacks, but still had this toxic mindset of it will never happen to me. I want to work in psychiatry. I want to be a doctor. Uh, I'm not a patient. You know, it won't happen to me, as so many people do um, have that as a kind of mindset and that denial. And then a very traumatic uh, event happened within my family around halfway through medical school and I'd already had quite a lot of low mood but always got out of it um, somehow and that essentially I think triggered me into uh, full-blown clinical depression which uh, lasted for about six months and I was in a lot of denial. I protested not to see my GP or anything like that. I really thought so much of it would just sort itself out as it always did. And it was down to willpower, which was obviously so stigmatising and so incorrect. Um, and I, it was such a strange disconnect because I was someone who knew was really informed about mental health and psychiatric illnesses, had a huge interest in the research and the innovations in it. And then when it happened to me, I was totally clueless. And so it took me a long time to get help. And then when I finally did, I'd say that's when this passion for holistic mental health really started. And I used the analogy the analogy of drowning out at sea. So if you can imagine yourself drowning, your head is literally below the water. You can barely lift it up to gasp for air. When I saw my GP and she aided me with the important psychoeducation and put me on antidepressants, they really allowed me to get my head above the water and become physiologically recalibrated and reattuned and really just be able to do the basics because up until that point, I wasn't sleeping, my appetite had vanished and I wasn't even able to wash my hair, make my own breakfast, construct an email or text message, the absolute basics. So seeing a clinician and going on antidepressants, which really did work for me. And this is to say that this is my analogy for my recovery might not work for you. Um, I was able to physiologically recalibrate. And in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I was able to honour the basic needs. And then to actually swim back to shore and be able to thrive rather than just survive I then started engaging in talking therapy, which I was only able to do once I'd got on the antidepressant because I'd actually tried talking therapy before seeing my GP because I was just so self-stigmatizing. And I couldn't, I had so much brain fog, I couldn't even have a conversation with the therapist sat across me. I didn't take in any of it. So it was a huge waste of time. And also it made my, it dropped my self-esteem even lower because I was like, well, nothing's going to work for me. I'm truly broken. So the antidepressant followed by the talking therapy, I then started to be able to swim back to shore and then really implement lifestyle interventions and um, 
coping strategies into my daily life. So for me, that's eating well for my body and for my mind, which is something we'll go into more. Moving my body, I enjoy yoga and walking. I'm not too sporty, but for me, I love being out in nature, walking my dog. Um, we know that the colour green actually has the power to reduce our blood pressure and put us into parasympathetic drive, encourage rest and digest. And we know that so much of the time in our stressful modern lives, we're constantly in fight or flight in sympathetic overdrive. And by getting my social connections back, which I would really withdrawn from during my time of being really depressed, and then choosing deliberately and intentionally and consciously what information I consumed, who I followed on social media, what I was putting into my mind from a nourishment point of view, and making sure that um, I was only keeping positive relationships, having boundaries and consuming inspiring stories and giving myself time for creativity, which is something that is so important to me. That was all the things that got me back to shore and back to land to actually carry on with life when I thought I wouldn't be able to. And so to me, that's my kind of story and my where my passion arose from holistic mental health. And since then... I really like seeing what things are out there in the space of startups and uh, mental health tech platforms and how many of these can support a lot of people in their everyday lives with their mental health without having to go into the full walls of a hospital. And that's why I think kind of what we call civil science and, and things that we can do in our day to day lives is so important and where so much of tech and healthcare innovation can come into play. It's a heck of a story, and thanks so much for sharing it, especially, you know, some incredibly personal elements there. Um, and it it makes me think about quite a lot, actually. I'm obviously an evangelist for technology, and the first thing that kind of stops me in my tracks is where someone comes on here and doesn't actually berate drug therapies and actually goes, no, antidepressants actually worked for me. And I think that's incredibly powerful, that because I think we might go too far perhaps on this podcast with the people that come on and say these different things. And I think you, you made a really good point that this is my journey. This is what worked for me. I'm telling you my truth and, and, and things can be different for everybody. And I think that's, that's something important that I do want to touch on. But before I do, it's to highlight the point that you're a doctor, a patient and a founder. So in terms of I, I know this concept from my own work life that I'm in communications and I create content and I feel like I, I, I feel like a big part, a big strength of mine in my work life is my ability to see things from different perspectives. I'm mixed race by mm. background. I, I, I understand and appreciate at a very visceral level that two things can be true at the same time. And actually seeing things from other people's point of view comes incredibly naturally to me because of my background. And I've spent so much time in different areas of healthcare from being a clinician to the managerial side, to entrepreneurship, to accelerators, to policy, to this, to that. I've seen healthcare from so many different vantage points that it gives me the strength in communications because I have this kind of often burden of empathy that actually if I if I wasn't so empathic about different <laughs> areas then you know I, I might I might back one side of an argument incredibly more more powerfully you know and I might actually have stronger opinions and things but I find myself being uh, having quite a lot of empathy for different sides. But it, I do feel that's a communication superpower because in order to generate mm. messages for different sides of an argument you've got to understand people's customers you've got to understand people's audiences and I feel like I can do that really well I think your story highlights that you have seen the issue of mental health from certainly the doctor and patient side but the way that you think about mental health you can also think about it because you're a founder and yes you're a founder in NutriTank and yes that's more of a food scenario but actually food and mood incredibly linked as we've talked about many times before and how that all links together so you're seeing this world from doctor patient and founder you're seeing that from three incredibly powerful different vantage points there and I suppose if I am to to put this into a question it's to it's it's to help me understand how you see technology in mental health and perhaps to touch on this element of drug therapies actually worked for me. 
and let's not mm-hmm. count them out. Let's not see technology as a holy grail, but perhaps part of many different things that can work. And is this all individual? I don't know. But I don't know. Can you reflect on that for me? Absolutely. So I guess in short, it all comes down to my belief in holistic mental health and not saying that any one thing is the panacea or silver bullet. And also there is no one size fits all. So of course we are moving into this personalized medicine space. And that's why I think it's so important to always have the caveat of this worked for me, it may not work for you. However, I can tell you about the bird's eye view that I have as a clinician and founder of what I'm seeing out there and you may want to try it and see if it works for you. So I would say from the drug therapy point of view, we have no idea how antidepressants work. I was recently at a brilliant symposium at um, Barts in the London and it was a whole afternoon for psychiatric trainees uh, with brilliant speakers who had totally different views on antidepressants. One of them was Professor Joanna Moncrief, who recently wrote that huge paper that said the serotonin theory for antidepressants is completely false and all of that. And that came out in the press uh, in 2022. And that really blew out a lot of um assumptions and hypotheses, but also a lot of people still didn't agree with what she was saying. Mm. And, you know, as every academic paper is, pros and cons, nuances and critical analysis and all of that. But my point being is, yes, we don't know how antidepressants work, but we still know that it works for, you know, almost 40 to 50 percent of the population. And we don't know how they work. But if it is something you can do and give important psychoeducation alongside movement as medicine and food and nutrition and all of that, then you can't eliminate it and we shouldn't be stigmatizing medication as well. I think it's also nuanced and we've seen content creators like Dr. Alex George, who does lots for the government on young people's mental health. He did the post your pill campaign, trying to destigmatize taking medication. Now, do I think that's a positive? I think it's completely nuanced. I think we shouldn't be carrying shame and stigma when it comes to medication, but we also should try and avoid glamorizing it And whilst we want to normalise it, we also want to say it's still only one piece of the puzzle and please don't become reliant on it that that is your fix at Mm. all because we have a horrible paradigm in modern medicine and Western medicine, which was why there was such impetus for me to co-found Nutritank where we have this, it's a pill for every ill. You know, Western medicine has literally produced this reductionist and reactive approach when it comes to um, chronic illnesses where we can think of a million pills to cure all ills. And I just think you have to always think of it as one piece of the puzzle so whilst I think it's great post your pill don't stigmatize yourself about medication I still say it is really one piece of recovery and overall good health and it's just so important to have those caveats in the conversation because otherwise people will just you know think straight away I'm not doing well doc prescribe me antibiotics doc prescribe me a pill and people get so demanding and so fixed on the pill that it will completely be their cure at all and lose sight of what they can do to empower themselves. So I think it's such a mixed conversation when it comes to drug therapy. I think it's also incredibly nuanced when we talk about the horrible side effects and withdrawal effects when it comes to drug therapy and why it's so important to have informed consent consent when you're talking to your patients about putting them on a medication is that it might be helping one aspect, but in the whole world of medicine, we've got this risk versus benefit Um, principle that we really need to abide by yes it's going to bring you some benefit but please know when I'm starting you on this antipsychotic for your schizophrenia for um, you know your psychosis whatever it will unfortunately probably have a huge burden on your metabolic system and therefore I need to tell you that you'll need to really be careful about your overall dietary pattern and about your sedentary lifestyle and physical activity because this is an absolute Um, you know, there is no doubt that it won't have an effect on your metabolic health. So you will absolutely have to think about things that you can mitigate that risk. I think if that psychoeducation and those risks aren't discussed with drug therapy, that's when we can also fall into traps. So I really do believe it's holistic. And we also know from the gut brain axis and our gut microbiome that when you have a flourishing gut microbiome, 
your medications that you take from a pharmacological point of view are also met- metabolized better and you get more effectiveness from those medications and might even need less and less of a dose than um, if you were you know, eating and consuming a diet of ultra processed food. So it literally just goes to show there's an interplay between everything and we have to take that bird's eye view approach. Um, so that's your uh, point on drug therapy. Your second part, of the question was about technology in the same way um, that I think most things are nuanced and a lot of things are neutral I think the same thing about tech and the time and the place for it based on where you're at in your mental state so I think you can separate it into different categories so the educational aspect that tech provides is probably one of my favorites and that's because I'm obsessed with storytelling. And my love of film really comes from the fact that for me, when I see someone else's story on the screen, when I read it in a nonfiction book, listen to a TED talk, that's when I feel that I have a deeper sense of self-compassion. And I also can relate to points in the story and think about how I can apply it to my own life. And also I feel a bit less of less shame, less loneliness that I think, okay, there are other people out there experiencing something similar to what I've experienced in terms of hardships and adversity so I think the way that tech can be used to tell stories whether it's platforms like YouTube and other social media platforms is incredibly powerful and a company that I'm doing some work with at the moment that I'd love to shout out is a new startup called Jack Just Ask a Question and what they're doing is they're building an entire digital mental health platform based on asking experts and experts by experience in the world of mental health around different questions so they record using wonderful videographers uh, people's stories and then through AI they have questions that you can select and so you can say to someone like Alistair Campbell or um, they've got loads of famous athletes on there what was getting your diagnosis of bipolar like? What was it like starting antidepressants? What was it like telling your family? And you click on that question and then someone, the human form, literally gives you their answer and you have almost a conversation with them. And it's so human. And the fact that we can get that from technology when, you know, it's people are arguing at the moment that it's becoming way less human. We're having avatars and all these different kind of things that, essentially take away that human aspect I think it's a powerful thing technology however I think consumption of technology needs to be regulated and also um, you need to be in touch with yourself depending on your mental state on how you use technology because when I was unwell for instance I didn't want to see anyone's successes I didn't want to see anyone going through anything because it, everything was triggering and I couldn't even maintain my social connections through replying to a text so I just think it's important to really check in where you're at and be careful of what content you're going to engage with based on your own mental state I also think you know what we're seeing with certain mental health startups in terms of digital biomarkers and how certain mental health companies are now actually using tools within their platforms, like looking at speed of typing, looking at voice note recognition to actually detect people who are becoming anxious, who are becoming low in mood based on their own kind of uh, digital biomarker fingerprint. And I think that's really powerful because so much of the time mental health is so intangible and we're using scales like Edinburgh Warwick and all other well-being scales that are used in general practice and psychiatry to really get an understanding of where that person is. But once again, it's a snapshot. So that data is actually going to be quite limited, whereas what you can do in a digital mental health platform is be able to have a complete graph of someone's overall month and they're doing that really well with bipolar so they're doing that with bipolar digital mood trackers so people can actually predict when they're becoming a bit manic and it helps their loved ones so much especially when their loved ones are part of the process with their safety plan when they fall into deep the depths of depression with their bipolar and um, become suicidal in thought so 
honestly, I do think tech can be one of the most powerful adjuncts to helping predict acute mental health relapses and things like that. But it's to be mindful that when you're in the throes of it acutely, you may want to be really mindful of how much you're using tech. So when you said there were three, is that education, biomarkers and prediction? Is that what you're saying? I think education, interaction to get social connections, because obviously, Mm. like you and I now, we're using tech to do so. And then obviously management and prediction when it comes to clinical mental illness. Got it. Yeah, those would be my three. And I think tech gets a bad name, doesn't it, when it comes to facilitating that social connection versus destroying that social connection. And I think as someone that, I mean, I... I game a bit, so I'm on my PlayStation, but I speak to so many of my friends when I do that. And actually, like, things like computer games can get such a bad rep for for creating isolation, but you see so often now, don't you, the stories online about the people that have met that have then eventually met in person because they've been online friends and they've connected over these very niche Mm -hmm. interests that the long tail of the internet (laughs) actually allows connection to, you know? And it's, it's so fascinating, but... I think, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned those education, interaction, and then management and prediction, because I think when we, when I think of mental health technology, I I default to thinking about number three there. I default to thinking about what are the platforms that are uh, digital therapeutics that are self-reported uh, symptoms that are connecting A to B in terms of allowing clinicians to talk to patients. I automatically just think about number three there. But number one and two are actually incredibly important, particularly when we think about, well, I'd have previously said prevention, but in your framework, holistic mental health, the parts of technology towards mental health that take you from uh addressing your acute needs to what you describe as daily coping strategies it's actually one and two there that are incredibly important mental fitness is a Mm. term that i've heard or propping up your mental health is another one right i think Mm, because it's maintenance it's maintenance is so important absolutely and i and i think that i think health tech actually has to move into in its definition and what we consider what we're actually part of here to this stuff far more than actually talking about prevention as this really separate entity to Mm. diagnosis and treatment. Actually, if we have the right ambition for health tech, is it not that all of this should be done now? And actually prevention becomes far more important. And yes, there's obviously going to be acute things that need solving. But even when you think of the business models, like there's only so much money that the NHS has in the UK or various health systems across the world have to spend on acutely managing and uh, diagnosing and, and, and all that stuff. When it comes to education and facilitating social interaction, this is far more, I guess, like a... A B to C component. I think it's low uh, hanging uh, fruit. But it, yeah, it's low, it's hang- low hanging fruit. fruit. This, this is the thing. This mm. is the thing in terms of the potential benefit. And I don't know totally. whether in health tech we might be just a bit like I don't know, a bit too prim and proper that we think like, oh, we're B to B here. We're big numbers. We're yeah. we're business to totally. business, and we need we need to we need to create these things that that can be bought at scale and enterprise and all those things. Is and, and you're, I guess you're very much in this world because you straddle it in terms of like the, the, the content you create and all that sort of stuff that you, you're, you're far more, I guess, on that. Well, you're certainly encroaching on that B2C side far more than like a, a big company is that's developing a digital therapeutic. And so it just feels to me like health tech needs to be more in that B2C zone, not least because mm-hmm. that's where people can more business models exist and actually more prevention exists. And actually, is that not the scale that we're looking for in helping mental health? I don't know. But you mentioned, you mentioned Jack. Are there any other tech companies in in mental health that that have your eye that you're interested in, that you look at, that you work with potentially? 
Well, I'd say just to comment on what you were saying about the importance of the education and using tech to aid that is if you just look at what YouTube is going into at the moment yeah. and the YouTube health team, they are literally using the hypothesis of information as a determinant of health. Mm. And that is so powerful because that's saying that all healthcare professionals who are content creators can literally create evidence-based, really engaging content that will keep people in the population from becoming patients outside the four walls of hospital because they're getting that education in the community um, every day. And I think that's really powerful. But I think we think of prevention in quite um, a kind of one dimensional way when really prevention can be from ever being diagnosed with a mental illness in the first place but also prevention can be once you've got a chronic condition that's unavoidable like bipolar schizophrenia and having tech aid um, in preventing further relapses and further acute periods of psychosis so I think it's all about education and it's interlinked with um, how we can use digital therapeutics to predict um, our own personal mental health trajectory. So I think it all kind of interacts. And I think it's actually there are multiple platforms at the moment that help with each of these three elements, the connection side and learning from people, exchanging each other's stories, that kind of support group community aspect. And then the education side and the digital therapeutics prediction and management side. But there's not one platform that does all of it. And I think that's probably wise because you need to have, you know, a focus and to know what your limitations are. So, uh, for instance, Jack like I've spoken about, is really going upon that premise of psychoeducation and the power of storytelling and that actually having an impact on someone's well-being because there's now a lot of data to support when people tell their story. If that resonates with an individual, that can actually improve their well-being and get them to engage in behavioural activation to look after themselves. So it's actually almost therapeutic in 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 that matter rather than it being like a drug and straight away so um i think it's really good for these med tech companies to know what their limitations are and and have a space and then signpost to further interventions yeah. and things like that because i don't think you can do it all i think it's almost impossible and why do it all it's not a good idea as a business to do everything um so so i guess other faves i'm really intrigued and enthused by Selena Gomez's Wonder Mind in the States. I think it's pretty amazing that a celebrity like that has come forward in the last couple of years to talk about her diagnosis of bipolar so openly, and she's hidden it for quite a while. And not only, and I think it's quite unusual actually with celebrities that they usually just come forward and tell their story, but she's come forward and told us her story and created a huge mental health digital company that she's got experts running um to help the masses so i think that's really impressive and i'm I'm really enjoying watching that i am also a big fan of some guys that i do some work with called mindful and they are a mental fitness platform uh founded by dr nick pryor a good friend of mine who um is a trainee psychiatrist and someone with lived experience of bipolar And it's such a powerful position he comes from as well. And he's trying to actually use tech to educate. And he has a reward system that he's built whereby um, you can learn about all different activities you can get involved in from nature practices to self-compassion and journaling practices to the arts, to movement, to cooking, whatever it is. So very holistic. And you hear different segments and videos about thought leaders in that space talking about that activity but then what it does it doesn't say do that activity right now together on this platform it says go out these are suggestions in your local community they've made a a data network geographically of what's out there go out and do it and that's where I think tech is an incredible springboard into just living your life and creating that accessibility of what's out there already that you may not know about and I I quite like tech being used for that because to be honest I don't really want to always be attached to a screen, even if I'm getting something therapeutic and educational about it. I want to be in the real world at a cooking class, at a pottery class and um, in nature rather than VR. So I think that's a really great one that I'm enjoying um, looking at their progress as well. 
I love that. The the this imperceptible nature of technology just helping us be more human. I just think that's such a wonderful concept. Um I know you've got a shoot in a couple of minutes, but before I let you go, tell me a bit about NutriTank. Absolutely. So it's been about six years since myself and my co-founder um essentially hatched the brainchild that is NutriTank and we've evolved into an a think tank, which was always the um, goal to essentially create research. We've got five publications around um, what the barriers are to implementing nutrition into healthcare curricula, as well as what the benefits are. And so we work on uh, think tank content as well as policy change, which has been incredible. We've managed to get a clause added to the 2019 NHS long term plan with a greater commitment to nutrition education for NHS staff. And we work very closely with Jamie Oliver and his campaigns team to do that after he invited us to go on telly with him, which was a wonderful invitation that came really out of the blue. Um, so NutriTank exists as a think tank, but also it's a community network. So we've built a nationwide network of healthcare professionals and healthcare students to meet one another and feel like, oh, I'm not the black sheep thinking about this kind of medicine and people think I'm crazy and it's a pseudoscience world. Um, they meet each other online. We've got a digital community platform that we host on Mighty Networks where all our conferences, webinars, all our content is uploaded on there. And essentially it looks, the interface is quite similar to Facebook and people post about different opportunities that they have and different events that they're going to. And it's really an ecosystem that we've built. And um, yeah, it's been an absolute privilege to have been, you know, uh, so kind of key to this movement in the UK around nutrition education. And it's really exciting. We've actually been invited to um, be part of the 75th anniversary NHS um, mm. memorabilia book to talk about our work with NutriTank and how we've innovated the healthcare education system in that sense. So, uh yeah, it's been very privileging and rewarding to have been able to make real impact in a short space of time over the last six years. And yeah, that's new to it. Um It's amazing how quickly time flies, doesn't it, Ali? Um, we have run out of time, but it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I think your your story, as I say, as a doctor, a patient and a founder gives your words incredible weighting. And actually, I love one of the things I love about the way you speak is is you are so evidence-based in what you say. You do have opinion, but there is so much about what you say that is backed up by evidence and, you know, the data suggests and recent papers say this. It, it's clear that you're someone that wants to make impact in the right way. And even through th- these new means of connecting content to community, to uh, to education and social interaction and how all of these come together to produce technology and, and with the people that you work with, but also um, your understanding of, of how that relates to diagnosis and treatment and biomarkers and, and, and stuff. I think the amount of impact that you can make, particularly as you're going through as a doctor um, and becoming influential in that regard, as well as everything you're doing in content, I think, a force to be reckoned with in future, I think, Ali, if not already. Oh, James. <laughs> <laughs> Should get that on a get, T-shirt. I, oh, absolutely. I think I need to get I think my boyfriend and my so dad are a fun. little bit scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they've been why. saying this for many years, even, <laughs> even before it became a professional thing. So <laughs> scaring Listen, the men it, in my life. It, no, it thank you for pleasure. having me on. It's been a welcome. pleasure chatting to you and love what you're doing with Somex and thank you. you're a star communicator. So, oh, thank um, you, yeah, thanks thank a million you. and chat soon. We will.